Um, Edward, can you hear me? You're mute. Yes. Um, sorry, just quickly before we get started. Um, I'm going to have you on the screen when I keep talking. So just indicate if I'm running out of time. But also, can you let me know if my internet connection starts failing me? Because, um, it, well, we are just about to have hyperoptic installed today. But until <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> I sometimes uh, um, start to get a bit fuzzy. So, so either I'll kind of, for the time thing, I'll probably like, yes. Yeah, put yeah a for out. the time thing, just, you know, something. Uh, but then for the internet mm -hmm. connection, I'll probably send you a message through the chat box. Or um, yeah, or even just come in and say, um, it sounds like we can't hear you properly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. No worries. We are now live. Hi everyone, um, welcome to the fourth session of the uh, in our JTRC webinar series um, on justice in low carbon transitions. Uh, my name is Edouard Marina, I'm a lecturer at the University of London Institute in Paris um, and I'm also involved in the Just Transition uh, Research uh, Collaborative. Um, and I have the distinct honor today of chairing uh, this session. Um, so this session is part of a webinar series which is organized by the Just Transition Research Collaborative as well as UNRISD um, with uh, support from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. So today's session um, is part of a series um, aimed at sharing some of our thinking and reflections uh, on a range of aspects and dimensions of Just Transitions that we feel are relevant to advanced justice um, in climate policies and decarbonization efforts. And today's uh, session uh, will be focusing on the very important issue of uh, financing just transitions. Um, and so we'll look at how different funding mechanisms operate, uh, what criteria are being used to select projects and allocate funds, uh, and what tensions also can sometimes arise uh, between various stakeholders involved. The presentations today will draw on very specific examples, so from Australia to start off with, um, in particular through kind of a focus on the closure uh, um, and the politics associated with the closure of a power station. Then we'll move over to Europe um, and discuss the European, uh, the EU Just Transition Fund, and then discuss as well, uh, finally, how the Green Climate Fund, uh, the largest multilateral climate fund, can more effectively channel just transition funding uh, to developing countries, as well as kind of discussing some of the challenges that uh, uh, exist as well in relation to this. Hopefully, and this is our overall ambition, uh, the discussion will show how climate finance can be used to advance social justice uh, and identify key entry points in financing debates to make sure that the low carbon transitions are just transitions. So I'm joined here today by a very distinguished uh, group of panelists uh, who will share some of their insights, reflections, as well as lived experiences uh, uh, with us. Um, and so after their initial round of presentations, we will also have some time for questions and answers. But before, I, uh, before we begin, um, I'd just like to make some brief announcements, in particular in relation to kind of housekeeping. Um, the first is that this session will be recorded and live streamed via UNRIS, uh, the UNRISD YouTube channel, uh, where it will also remain available afterwards. Um, and so if you are interested, you know, and if this is the first session of the webinar series you are uh, following, you can also watch um, previous sessions. They are all available on the UNRISD YouTube channel. Um, you will also see that we have enabled both a, a general chat box um, and a Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Um, so please use the Q&A box uh, for your questions. Um, so the very specific questions that you would like to ask our panelists uh, um, in relation to the, today's topic. Um, the general chat box you can also use to provide some kind of more general comments or information um, that you 
also feel uh, is relevant um, in relation to today's topic and that you would like to share uh, with the rest of the audience. Um, for the questions in the Q&A box, you will actually have, a, uh, you have the opportunity to vote or to like uh, different questions. And so please feel free to do so as this will also be very useful and helpful to us uh, when kind of identify, in order to kind of identify the questions uh, that most people would like to see answered. And finally, uh, at the very end of the webinar, we will share a link uh, to a very short, so very short, so it doesn't take a long time to answer, three question feedback survey. Um, and so just, we would really greatly appreciate if you could fill that in. I mean, it's very important for us to get your feedback on both the session and how it went, uh, things we can improve uh, for future sessions, but also on issues, you know, more uh, uh, um, relevant to kind of the topics that are also being discussed uh, uh, within this webinar series and more generally within the JTRC. So um, now uh, let's move over to the, uh, the presentations. Um, so to begin with, uh, as I say, I have the honor of um, introducing Darren Snell. Um, who is an associate professor uh, in the School of Management at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Um, he uh, co-coordinates the Skills Training and Industry Research Group, um, and he has developed a stream of research focused on labour and economic transitions in um, carbon exposed regions. Through his applied research uh, and trade union activities, he works closely with unions and governments on finding practical just transition solutions for workers disadvantaged by environmental policies and industrial uh, restructuring. Um, so I now pass over the floor uh, to you, Darren. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me uh, today for this. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. And I will make sure I stick to time. Uh, okay, um, look, where I want to begin the discussion uh, today is really around this question of, um, if you like, the question about global energy companies themselves, um, and to what degree they're committed to financing just transition. You know, we see multinational energy companies are under considerable pressure. Uh, by government, by financial institutions, shareholders, and other stakeholders uh, to transition to cleaner fuels. And any number of these companies on here at the moment uh, often present their commitment to transitioning to low, lower carbon technologies and present themselves as part of the solution um, and indeed as part of their social and environmental commitments. Um, so I wanna present that question about financing just transition, which they don't talk quite as much about. Um, and, and what I really wanna look at is the, the implications of uh, headquartered decisions, if you like, senior management decisions on the future of local carbon emitting assets. And that must also be part of the story and how well they manage that closure uh, process. And I'm drawing upon uh, uh, both personal uh, involvement in, in some of the challenges in, in Australia, uh, but also my own research. We know that global energy companies are committed to a whole range of areas, whether it's mine rehabilitation, power station uh, demolition, site remediation, and of course, provision of redundancy and other worker entitlements. These tend to be legal obligations. And I guess my question is about that broader corporate social responsibility and other areas related to just transition for us to think about. You know, are there other things that uh, global energy companies can commit to, both financially, but also more broadly? Um, with regards to community regeneration, reinvestment, uh, and certainly employment support for those uh, workers that are uh, displaced. And the example I'm gonna speak about very quickly is the example here in Australia with the closure of the Hazel Hazelwood Power Station, which some of you may know a bit about, but I'll go very quickly through its sort of uh, long history, if you like, as a, as a 
carbon emitting power station uh, in an area in which I live. Um, it initially was built by the State Electricity Commission of Victoria. Uh, so it was a state-owned enterprise in a sense. Um, started operating in 1964, expected to be shut down by 2005, um, but lived a, much longer than that. It's a, considered or was considered one of the most carbon intensive power plants in the country. Uh, because of its fuel being uh, lignite or brown coal, what it's referred to here in Australia, and it provided 58% of the, of the state's electricity. So very carbon uh, intensive. Um, it was privatized, it was sold to uh, British Power, International Power initially, and GDF Suez, or NG as we know it today, acquired it in 2011. So it has this sort of, you know, interesting history going from a publicly owned uh, power generation asset to a privatized one and the challenges associated with that in terms of just transition. There was a, a, a quite intensive um, mine fire in 2014, uh, yeah, 14 that went for 45 days which sort of hinted at you know, some significant challenges there. That middle picture you see is the open cut and you also see the town of Mowell right next door to that open cut, which took the brunt of that uh, open cut mine fire for those 45 days. Angie announced closure in November of 2016, largely in response to um, the, the decisions made in France to, uh, by shareholders and indeed uh, the CEO at the time, to transition away from, um, from um, coal-fired generation. By March 2017, uh, it, was, uh, it was officially closed. So it was a very short closure period. There wasn't a lot of notice. It was, a, uh, in a sense, not all that uh, unexpected. It was an aging power plant. People knew it was on life support in many ways. There wasn't a lot of investment going into it, but nonetheless, it came as a, as a surprise. So I wanna talk about the sort of initiatives that were put in place. And one of the major ones I wanna focus on is uh, what was known as the worker transfer scheme. The idea here was, that uh, there would be an industry-wide early retirement scheme whereby it would open up uh, potential job opportunities in some of the other power plants in this uh, um, coal region. And the unions were heavily involved in this initiative, certainly uh, thought that there would be 200 plus workers uh, that would be transitioned to some of these other power plants through this scheme. Um, and the government put in a significant amount of money to support this. For every worker that was re-employed by one of the other power plants, they would receive 75,000 Australian dollars uh, in support for taking on an ex Hazelwood worker. There was a lot of hope in this scheme. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really, uh, what taken up by the other power plants in the ways that one had hoped. And indeed, the early uh, uh, redundancies were largely used as a downsizing exercise more than anything. But at the end of the day, there were around 100 workers which were uh, successfully transitioned into another power plant and continued to work. There was another worker transition support services, fully government financed, but also involved the trade union movement. Uh, in helping workers uh, get career support and employment support and so on. Lots of support for retraining, once again, fully government financed, uh, both those directly and indirectly employed by Hazelwood uh, through contract companies, but also family members. So this was an important initiative. The other one was a significant amount and it continues to operate today of job creation schemes through a special economic zone for the Latrobe Valley where these power plants are located to encourage business investment into the region. 
These are, uh, were quite significant investments on the part of, of government. $20 million uh, uh, for the supporting workers and families, another $40 million, I believe, is the estimate currently in terms of this sort of job creation and special economic zone initiative. Uh, but the question, I suppose, for many in the region was, did NG do enough? Uh, could it have done more? Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about just transition and preparing for a closure situation. There was a lot of working with the power companies, hoping that they would come on board and support the community and displaced workers in ways that they were felt pretty let down in many ways, um, particularly around the worker transfer scheme uh, and so on. And so my question for us to think about, and I'm conscious of the time, is to what degree we, we need to think about getting these global energy companies to do a bit more um, in terms of their corporate social responsibility in relation to the justice trend, just transition uh, principles which we we all embrace here. So I will stop there. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Darren. Um, we'll uh, move straight over to the next uh, speaker. So um, Nora uh, Schuttpelz, uh, who is a political scientist, um, graduated at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, she's an alumna uh, of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation Scholarship Program. Um, and she is a currently policy advisor at the European Parliament since uh, 2004. And she supports uh, the member of Europe, the European Parliament, uh, Martina Michels, and her work in the Committee for Regional Development and the Delegation for the, Rele the Relations with Israel. Um, Nora closely follows the negotiations on the next generation of EU structural funds. Um, and in particular, the Just Transition Fund, um, uh, which we will talk about uh, now. And she's also involved in discussions around the European uh, Regional Development Fund. So Nora, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me as a representative uh, of the Link in the European Parliament uh, in this debate on uh, Just Transition. As the left in politics, we, of course, uh, we don't, uh, work independent of, uh, of society, but uh, quite the other way around. We're taking up the ideas of movements uh, and progressive research that um, transition to a carbon neutral world is indeed necessary to preserve our earth, uh, but that the such transition must be socially balanced. Um, that such transition to a different climate friendly economy and way of living must be inclusive and must not leave the most vulnerable behind and that's and that it needs to be a, a participatory process. Um, this is why we have supported the idea of a just transition fund in Europe uh, from the beginning. So what's this fund all about? The EU aims to cut greenhouse gas emissions and we know it is all too late and too little but that's what we have aims to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030 and to achieve climate neutrality by 2050 at the latest. To this end, the EU has developed or adapted several tools to finance the transition to low carbon energy and production, uh, but the Just Transition Fund is the one most expressively designed to address the social, economic and environmental impacts of the transition. Um, the European Parliament, by the way, has been calling for such a fund as early as March 2018, but it's only two years later that the newly elected European Commission has made a key step forward um, from a mainly growth-oriented economic policy orientation towards a more climate protection and sustainability-oriented policy approach with the Green New Deal, which was followed by the legislative proposal for the Just Transition Fund um, in the beginning of this year. The Just Transition Fund will be embedded in the system of the EU regional cohesion policy. And I believe this is a good choice as cohesion policy is and has always been the most visible and practical expression of solidarity inside 
uh, the EU and among its regions. And if you want, uh, it has been the expression of reallocation of wealth inside the EU since the 1970s. The Just Transition Fund is specifically targeted uh, at regions most dependent on fossil fuels and related carbon intensive industries. These regions will be supported in diversifying their economies and creating new jobs. The supported activities will include investments in small and medium sized enterprises, in research and innovation, in renewable energy, in emissions reduction, in clean energy technologies, but also in site regeneration in and in circular economy, and also in upskilling and reskilling of workers. The European Parliament on its side, in its majority, is negotiation, ne negotiating to strengthen and make more visible and more tangible uh, the social dimension of this fund. This means, for example, funding should be provided to also to a social infrastructure uh, and it should help municipalities to uphold their social services. Energy poverty will be an issue in these areas. Um, and this needs to be prevented or reduced if we look for acceptance for renewable energies. The cultural heritage of mining and industry communities is part of the workers' and people's lives, and they rightly expect that this heritage is maintained. The transition will also inevitably mean a loss of jobs, at least for a certain time, uh, even if new and more jobs are, uh, are created. This job creation and reskilling will take some time. Transitional support will therefore be needed, uh, but also support for childcare will be needed, support for time, time, uh, part-time work. So one other important decision to take is whether or not uh, the Just Transition Fund should support energy from natural gas as a comparatively cleaner source of energy and as a transition technology. This is indeed one of the major battles inside the European Parliament. Some argue in favor of natural gas for social and energy poverty reasons. I believe, and we mostly believe that the EU with any of our funds, but the least with the Just Transition Fund should not uh, fund such phase out technologies, but the EU should should EU funding should be for real future oriented technologies. Uh, not the least because, uh, and I, I come to this now, the, the EU budget is comparatively, comparatively much smaller than national budgets. Um, yeah, as I said, these, these, matter, these are matters of political decisions and uh, of the scope of support, but also it's a matter of budget. While in the beginning, the EU Commission foresaw uh, only 7.5 billion euros for seven years, these proposals have varied over time. At the moment, as it stands, the member states are ready to give for seven years, 17.5 billion euros. The European Parliament calls for 25 billion euros. Uh, some research say we'd rather need 3 trillion over the next 10 years for additional investments. And if you have the same issue with dealing with such numbers as I do, here's one example. Uh, Germany as a country has promised 42 billion to the coal enterprises to, to support them in their very late phase out of coal until uh, 2038. So now we are talking of one third of this amount um, that is there for German companies, but we are now talking of one third but for the 81 designated areas in the European Union altogether. Surprisingly or not, uh, the COVID-19 crisis seems to have strengthened uh, the political acceptance of the idea of state intervention in order to mitigate and pre prevent negative effects arising from uh, exceptional challenges. But as we see, there is still the well-known reluctance of member states uh, to provide sufficient money to the EU budget in general, but even less for the real redistribution in particular. But let's also say something about the allocation of the money. It might surprise you to hear that Germany as one of the richest EU countries will be one of the biggest receivers just after Poland and before Romania, Czech Republic and Bulgaria. Why? 
The allocation method looks at the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from industry to be reduced as economic criterion on the one hand, but also on the other hand, at the number numbers of employment in carbon intensive industry and in mining on the other hand. Um, the funding is supposed to go to these coal regions and in Germany, this means mostly some areas in the former East and one coal region in the former West. And those regions have indeed to face severe structural changes and uh, are not among the most rich regions. And since we have seen that over, over the past 30 years, reallocation inside Germany has not very well functioned. There's still a huge gap. Um, as much as we support cohesion policy uh, in general, also here we think this allocation method is acceptable, even if there may be better ones. But in the end, if the coal regions are the, are the target groups, um, it is without question where in, in Europe they are located. However, if we support the EU budget as an instrument for wealth redistribution, and I do so, then the programming and the planning, the definition of needs and the choice of project must be made in close partnerships with the local level, with stakeholders like trade unions, environmental and social organizations. Just to summarize, um, I believe the Just Transition Fund in, in the EU is a promising start. However, it will only turn to be a success story if it will be sufficiently funded, if it will be clearly oriented towards sustainable green energy production and infrastructure, if it has a tangible social dimension for the people and the regions and municipalities, if it has strong participatory elements, and if it is embedded in a um, coherent, in coherent social, economic, and climate strategies that are applied throughout all EU and national policies. Et voilà, and this is what we as the left are uh, fighting for at the European Parliament. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora, for this uh, for this presentation. Um, I think there are just so many, you know, you touch on so many things. That I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So again, please feel free to, to ask your questions through the Q&A box. Um, now we'll move over. So we'll, we'll switch over to Jessica, uh, Jessica uh, Omukuti, um, uh, who is a postdoctoral uh, research associate at the Interdisciplinary Global, Global Centre at the University of York. Um, she is a UKRI COP26 fellow. And her current research uh, focuses on climate justice and equity uh, in the delivery of climate finance for adaptation in developing countries. She has a PhD in climate justice and climate finance from the University of Reading, uh, a master's in climate change and development from the University of Sussex and a bachelor degree in meteorology from the University of Nairobi. Um, so Jessica, the floor is yours. Um. Thank you very much. Um, and um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, today, I would like to talk about um, financing just transitions in developing countries. And first of all, um, one point I'd like to make is um, for me and for a lot of people working on um, on climate justice in developing countries, just transitions um, mean that um, there's an equal split between investments in adaptation and, and mitigation. And um, in this regard, it means that communities are supported to, um, to engage in low carbon climate resilient activities that are in alignment with the Paris Agreement. Um, but also just transitions means that you equally allocate the costs and benefits, you equitably allocate costs and benefits of these low carbon climate resilient development activities um, amongst groups and that's, um, within generations and between generations. And we have particular attention paid to those who are very vulnerable within, um, within, these, um, within these communities. Um, however, overall, there are very significant challenges in achieving these transitions. For example, there's um, political economy factors that prevent, um, that limit the capacity, political will and political will um, to commit towards low carbon transitions both within developing countries, but also in the overall climate finance architecture, climate change um, landscape. 
But then one thing that I'd like to talk about today is um, the gap of climate finance. Um, first of all, there's deficits in how much finance is allocated to climate action in developing countries um, domestically, but also developed and developed to develop country, developing countries flow, flows. Um, and this in a way compromise the progress towards the Paris Agreement, but also how, how that money is spent is also um, a, a compromise. The limited amount that is available also compromises just transitions. And today I'd like to talk about um, how, um, what role the GCF, the Green Climate Fund plays in um, advancing just, just transitions in these countries, um, but also highlighting the opportunities and the gaps in, in the GCF's current activities. Um, just a very quick introduction to the Green Climate Fund. It was, um, it, it was I think, um, it became operational in 2015. Um, it is a mechanism, it's a multilateral climate finance mechanism, and it works through a number of institutions. So the GCF itself is made up of a board of representatives. Um, it has 24 members, 12 from developed countries and 12 from developing countries, but also um, supporting the operations of the board is an independent secretariat, which um, engages in project preparation and implementation. But then the board approves these projects and approves um, the GCF's um, operational policy policies and the overall direction that the GCF is supposed to take. But then there's the de designated authorities, which represent the recipient countries, the recipient developing countries. And these are basically government representatives who, uh, whose role is to identify adaptation and mitigation priorities. But they also um, appoint accredited entities who are, whose role is to implement adaptation and mitigation within, within their countries. And so governments appoint accredited entities. The entities are accredited by the GCF and money is used, money is channeled towards recipient countries through accredited entities. Um, and proposals are submitted by these accredited entities to the GCF and um, proposals have to be aligned with, um, with an, an, a GCF investment criteria, which has um, I think about six. Um, six kind of uh, main areas. Um, one of them is sustainable development. A project has to either show that it is contributing to sustainable development. Um, a project should um, show that it is another, another criteria is um, paradigm shift. Um, another one is country ownership. And so projects have, proposals have to show that they are contributing towards dif these different criteria for them to be funded. And so what I'm going to um, highlight are in my opinion, some of the two most important kind of gaps, but also opportunities for the GCF to advance just transitions in developing countries. And one of them is the role played by the private sector. Um, so there has been an increasing um, emphasis um, within the climate finance architecture on the role that climate, that the, on the role that private sector finance um, can play in, in advancing climate action. And this is mostly because of the deficit that I, 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 I mentioned earlier, there's not enough finance um, to support the ambition. And so um, encouraging private sector investments can increase the amount of finance and increase the ambition that's available because, and, and, so, and so the GCF has led, um, this, um, has led this movement by leveraging its comparative advantage of being the largest multilateral climate fund um, and also being aligned with country um, country ownership priorities and its ability to de-risk climate finance investments or just overall climate investments in developing countries and unlock climate action. And so the GCF has been working with private sector actors globally to channel investments towards low carbon climate resilient sectors or areas within developing countries. For example, the GCF has supported climate ambition through a range of new and innovative instruments that are very friendly to private sector investments. And so these are, um, they, they are mixed up or they are overlaid over public investments and they're invested in, like I mentioned, in specific sectors that are critical for low carbon transitions. But then one issue is that these, these investments are, have a bias in them. And so they are channeled through very specific sectors and overlook, not really overlook, but there's more investments going towards specific sectors and less going towards others, which in a very great sense compromises just transitions in developing countries. For example, 
Um, the largest proportion of private sector investments are channeled, that are channeled through the GCF are likely to be allocated towards renewable energy access and generation. And there's limited focus on sectors, on, and, and for the GCF, these are result areas, um, for on sectors such as ecosystems, um, ecosystem and ecosystem services, and then there's resilient infrastructure and low emission transport in developing countries. And if you think about these sectors that have received comparatively limited investment, you realize that there are sectors that are most likely to benefit vulnerable um, uh, vulnerable groups, very specific vulnerable groups in developing countries. For example, ecosystem services are important for rural communities because they support livelihoods and overall well-being. Um, ecosystem services provide energy, they provide medicine, they provide food. Um, the investments into low emissions transport are likely to benefit low income urban households and communities that rely on public transport and that live in very densely populated areas that have high um, um, pollution, noise um, and, and you know very high costs for transport. Um, and so and so the oh, given that and um, so investments into Renewable energy is probably because renewable energy technology has grown very fast over the last few years. And there is proven, there's proven evidence to show that if you invest in renewable energy, you're going to get quicker returns. And so that is why there's more evidence, there's more investments that accompanies the growth in technology and growth of evidence. Um, there is um, a 2019 forward-looking um, performance evaluation of the GCF and another evaluation of the GCF on its, um, on, on, on its approach to country ownership also indicated a bias in investments towards mitigation by the GCF, which means that the 50-50 split between in actual investments is not actually achieved. And so investments in mitigation means that low, the, the highly vulnerable communities receive less attentions, attention and mitigation activities are less likely to be implemented at the local, at, at the local level. And so you'll find that um, 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 you know, um, firms, um, enterprises are targeted for mitigation for investments that target uh, low uh, reduction in emissions, as opposed to adaptation, which actually targets local communities and local groups that are vulnerable. Um, the bias in these investments emerges from within the climate finance landscape. Like I mentioned, there is a lot of evidence emerging that um, that investments in low in, in renewable energy produces very quick returns, but also technology and renewable energy is growing very fast. But things such as um, things like, such as um, ecosystem services, there's still a lot of uncertainty on how technology can be applied to ecosystem services, especially in some regions. Um, and, and so investors are more likely to go for things that generate quicker economic so and social returns so that they can prove to the investors that these things work. And even though the GCF is working to de-risk these investments, investors are still likely to go for you know sectors like such as renewable energy as opposed to um, um, you know uh, uh, low emissions transport or ecosystem services. And so, one other gap before I finish is um, the the. The GCF has placed emphasis on the importance of social and environmental safeguards and gender gender policy, which are used to in in you know at, at the policy level. These the, the role of these policies is to ensure that um, activities in, investments do not and do not harm the environment and do not harm communities. Do not harm. Um, do not kind of negate or advance gender stereotypes or inequalities. But then a recent review of the GCF's environmental and social safeguards indicates that there's a gap in the design and implementation and as far, it goes even as far as monitoring of these safeguards and policies. And the evaluation indicates that um, the core benefits of investments, which are linked to environmental and social benefits are not really leveraged when projects are being designed and implemented. And th this means that things such as country ownership, things such as um, how projects are likely to um, to advance um, or to 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 you know to advance environmental protection or environmental benefits or how social relations or social um, social cohesion within communities are not really leveraged and so this means that for advancing just transitions the GCF is 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 kind of has is experiencing significant gaps 
because if these opportunities are not taken advantage of, it means that um, the costs, current communities are not, uh, you know, the costs and benefits are not really being distributed equ equitably. Communities are likely to suffer from um, directly and indirectly from the implementation of implementation of projects, which means that these transitions towards a low carbon climate resilient um, development future is not really equitable in, 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 in its own sense. And so opportunities in this case means that there needs to be, um, a, you know, a, equal emphasis on investments in different, in all the result areas, including those areas that support vulnerable communities in different areas within these developing countries, and an equal emphasis and advancement of, in the implementation of the gender, environmental and social safeguards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. This was really, really great. And um, again, I'm sure there will be some interesting kind of responses and questions to some of the points that you that you raised. Um, before we open up to the floor, uh, I'd just like to, again, encourage people um, uh, to ask questions. So please do use the Q&A uh, box to ask your questions to the panelists. Um, and also, I'd like to just uh, uh, open the floor to Sana Markanen, our discussant uh, for today. Um, so Sana is a research associate at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, uh, where she works on climate policy and financing sustainable infrastructure. Sana co-authored a recently published, published paper, Social Impacts of Climate Change Mitigation Policies and Their Implications for Inequality. Um, after completing her PhD in social policy in 2007, uh, Sana worked as a researcher uh, and lecturer in the UK and Australia. She has extensive and diverse experience of policy evaluation and social policy research. In recent years, uh, Sana has carried out research on energy efficiency uh, and the social and economic impacts of the transition, uh, including um, um, the inequality impacts of climate change and mitigation policy. So um, Sana, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Edward, and thank you for um, UNRIS for inviting me to be the discussant for this very interesting um, seminar. Um, and many thanks to all the speakers who delivered excellent presentations um, highlighting um, many extremely interesting and um, important issues that we need to discuss um, and certainly will be in the years to come. Um, and there is just four main points that I would like to sort of draw out of the speakers' presentations. Um, and the first is really the challenge of ensuring that just transition funding is fairly allocated. And this is in regards to allocation of the funding to countries, regions, communities or projects that need it the most. Um, and this is a problem, as we saw from Nora's presentation in Europe, uh, but it's also a problem globally, um, as we saw from Jessica's presentation. And it's further exacerbated in, in some countries, in particular in the global south, but not exclusively so, um, where we have political regimes in power that may not treat, uh, treat all ethnic groups um, or all genders equitably. Um, so that's the first point. And the second um, point um, I'd like to highlight is the insufficient supply of funding. Um, and in some ways, this can exacerbate the fair allocation challenge because the amount of funding that is specifically earmarked uh, to just transition is very limited. And as we heard from Nora's presentation, um, very much inadequate to address the challenge. Um, there is heavy reliance on co-financing, and this is something that Jessica talked about in detail. Um, but this is where we really come into a conflict because the different types of projects that are most appealing to private sector investors, as Jessica mentioned, such as renewable energy projects, and also projects that might be located in regions that have sufficient public sector resources um, to co-finance a large scale economic restructuring process, such as potentially some projects in Germany. Um, they may not be right for the scene as the most deserving, um, by others who are outside of these regions. Um, and this brings me to the third point, which is the allocation criteria and conditionalities. Um, so in order to secure public support for just transition spending, um, it is really important that the impact of the funding can be measured in some um, quantifiable way. And this is what Jessica talked about. 
However, this can mean that some of the allocation criteria are needed, but these kinds of criteria can also have some unintended consequences. So on one hand, there is a risk that certain allocation criteria could incentivize a so-called race to the bottom um, as a result of being or perceived need to demonstrate a higher level um, of need by sticking to emission intensive practices or not doing enough at the national level to um, reallocate the employment in um, emission intensive sectors or um, try to use national level or regional level funds um, to reallocate um, employees away from those sectors that are going to be impacted by the transition. And on the other hand, there is um, the challenge that conditionalities, such as the need to align um, a specific project with broader regional development strategy or long-term climate targets. Um, and these kinds of conditionalities can mean that a lack of capacity at the project level or at the local level or the regional level can mean that those projects that are actually and representing people who are in the highest level of need will not be able to access these funds because they lack the capacity to demonstrate how these funds will be efficiently used and they lack the capacity um, to develop these long-term strategies or link their specific project to national level or regional level long-term strategies. Um, and this can be a barrier to effective allocation of funds. And last but not least, is to focus on the energy sector. So if we look at all sectors of the economy, the energy sector does need to transport almost radically. And initially this is through shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources, but eventually there will be a need to change business models from the currently prevailing ones, where um, people pay for the energy that they consume to an entirely new approach that treats energy access as a service because generating energy is actually going to be almost um, free. Um, and this brings me to something that I'd like to elaborate a bit more if I have time left. Um, and this is that other sectors of the economy matter for two. Um, although the energy sector is incredibly important for this transition, you can't transition to a net zero carbon economy um, or society by transitioning the energy sector alone. So other sectors of the economy also need to transform. Um, and for many of these, such as the auto manufacturing industry, um, this transformation can be quite disruptive. Um, and it will affect not just the actual car manufacturing industry, but all of the supply chain, much of which is located in quite poor areas of uh, reasonably low income countries. It will also affect the steel and cement industry, um, where high levels of investment will be required um, in innovation and production, uh, new production technologies. Um, and there is also a challenge in the regions where the local economy is heavily reliant on sectors that are diminishing. Um, and this is what Darren was talking about, um, an example of a region um, or a town where a lot of the employment is, is associated with a specific, um, well, specific um, employer who then decides to shut down operations. And it's not just the people who are employed by these coal mines or car manufacturing plants that will be affected. Um, it really is a broader challenge that expands beyond these people um, whose jobs are directly at risk and includes also those whose livelihoods depend on the spending power of the people who are employed by these plants, such as all the local shops um, and many other services, such as well in the UK, for example, the local pub. Um, and this is something that is often more, um, well, given a lot less attention in the just transition discourse. And at the same time, if we look at how the different sectors are doing, the energy sector transition is already well underway, um, in particular in highly developed or highly advanced economies. Um, and this is partly because it has been more receptive to strong policy interventions, but it's also reasonably well underway, as Jessica showed, uh, in many developing countries because it is easier to attract private sector finance for renewable energy projects because they're able to generate a revenue. Um, and if we look at the picture globally, while we have plenty of examples of how things have gone terribly badly when coal power plants, for example, have been shut down, 
we're also developing a growing evidence base of good practices that have been environmentally appropriate as well as economically profitable and socially just. So what I'd like to highlight is that the problem is not that just transition is impossible to deliver, but it's rather a question of how we can harness a broader set of financial resources, including private sector funds, but also climate finance and development finance, and just plain old finance, and to support clean growth in developing countries, because let's face it, it's not as much of a transition in some countries as it is a development challenge. Um, as well as business practices that are socially um, as well as environmentally responsible. Um, so the reason why I like to highlight all of this is that the way I like to think about just transition is that it's a challenge that has two dimensions. So on one hand, we need to mitigate the negative impacts of the transition on the people who are directly impacted for example, people who are losing their jobs in the coal or oil industry. And on the other hand, uh, just transition is really an opportunity for us um, to use the low carbon transition um, to reduce and erase existing inequalities. Um, and this can be particularly important if we look at how private sector financing um, could be um, implemented in this situation. So the idea is that we should not, thank you, we should not rely solely on the just transition funds. So funds that are earmarked specifically for just transition, but also in private sector investment. And this can come through companies that are willing to incorporate social justice in their operations as they transition their operations to cleaner and greener. So going back to Darren's question um, that he finished with, should we ask for energy companies to do more? And I would say absolutely, we have to do that. But the question is whether we ask the outgoing company, so those companies that shut down the coal power plants or another private sector company to, to, um, to help address this challenge is slightly less clear. Because if you look at the opportunities that we have for, um, for work, working together with the private sector, you could have, for example, companies that invest in green energy infrastructure and generation capacity to locate their green energy projects in areas that have suffered or are expected to suffer heavy job losses. It could mean recruitment and internship programs that focus on improving gender balance or ethnic diversity among the employees. Um, it could mean in-house training opportunities and internship options for people with more well, less traditional educational background to reduce existing income inequalities in areas where they do locate their operations or to use supply chains to create new jobs in regions where unemployment are, is either high at the moment or is it expected to grow as a result of the transition. So the point is um, that we can achieve um, a lot more by working together with the private sector um, and the more financing we can harness through the private sector, the more of the earmark just allocation funds and other public sector resources will be available to finance the supporting activities that are less able to generate a profit, so less able to attract private sector investment. And this is things such as educational programmes um, or clean transport links and other low carbon infrastructure that can help regions to make themselves or local areas to, or municipalities to make themselves more attractive for future employment and, and investment opportunities for the private sector. Um, and this is where I will finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sana, uh, for those comments and ideas. And um, maybe I would just um, I guess before we go on to kind of uh, questions from the floor, uh, maybe ask a panelist to uh, briefly respond to some of the points that were uh, presented by uh, by Sana. So maybe I don't know. Does, does um, you know? I'm thinking in particular of, of her final point as well on the role of the of the private sector. I mean, maybe you know, panelists have kind of reflections on that. So um, does anyone in particular want to begin, or should I just designate someone? Maybe Darren. Do you want to? Do you want to? Respond. Um, yeah, look, I, it's a and part of the reason I've um, become interested in this is for some time I've looked at. Sorry, uh, your camera's off. I think. 
Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was responding to some of the questions here. Um, I've been, you know, looking at global energy companies for some time, particularly, you know, and and how they're wanting to to move towards renewable energy and be part of the solution and and the challenges that they front they confront in making that that transition. I mean, it, it is significant stranded assets for for some of them. Um, you know the the. To the case of the the, the Hazel, Hazelwood closure, for example, um, I was looking at some of the costs for uh, NG in terms of the mine rehabilitation, and it's you know according to their estimates, four hundred and forty million dollars. Power station decommissioning, three hundred million dollars. And if you throw in the sort of leave entitlements and redundancies, you're talking another three hundred million dollars. So. You know, it's about a billion dollars all up. The, I guess the question is, you know, you know, it's no small expense um, for the company, but this is also a global energy giant with revenue of sixty billion dollars last year, uh, euro. So I guess my question is, you know, um, and yes, there, there's always this talk. Of, you know, I've lived in a in this brown coal region for many years, and there's always this grand dream to turn it into a green renewable energy um, uh, region. Be fantastic, but the fact of the matter is, is that that's not an easy transition to happen. Investments not interested in that region for for renewable energy, although there is some of that development happening. Um, so. I do think, you know, um, we have to open up a, a conversation with these global entities on how and in what ways they can remain committed to those regions where they have extracted considerable amounts of revenue um, to help them transition and attract investment. While it's not just their investment, perhaps other investment. Um, and part of that is, being more committed to stage closures and closures with a longer lead up period so those communities have time to transition um, and governments have time to respond. So that's the general comment. Thanks, Darren. Um, maybe Jessica, would you like to give some brief kind of reflections or responses to uh, some of the ideas that were put forward by Sana? Yes, um, um, thank you very much, Sana. Um, thank you, Eduardo. Um, yes, so I, I, I am really glad that Sana agrees with um, most of what I said. Um, and, and, so, um, and so just to, um, to also agree with Sana, <laughs> um, the private sector um, for developing countries, um, there's, you know, the issue is that capitalism created this and it may not be able to resolve this, but I am also a very um, firm believer that we have to engage with the private sector in, um, in developing countries in order to achieve the scale of action that we need, especially given the global political economy. Um, and so, um, and, and investments um, as, as the GCF um, has shown, investments in renewable energy are quite important. And um, as Sana mentioned, I, I, I'm not advocating um, for, uh, yeah, I, I agree with Sana, we, we're not advocating for less investments in renewable energy because such things are, renewable energy equally benefits rural communities. But also the issue here is equal investments in all result areas that are relevant for um, mitigation and adaptation. And that is the only way to achieve just transition or else we will end up achieving, we, we, we end up achieving very, um, let's say good coverage for renewable energy. And then five or 10 years from now, we realize that we don't have any ecosystem services or we can, we, we've made very little progress for, on, 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 on other result areas. And so that means that we will place the burden for these other um, result areas, for these other outcomes on a population that probably had very little to do with it or a population that already contributed towards addressing an earlier problem. And so 
I think thinking about how we can allocate or equally distribute these costs and benefits right now is a very important role for the GCF. And I think I may have to bring that up probably in the Q&A about how we think the GCF can actually advance these actions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, and I'll switch now over the mic to uh, Nora uh, to maybe give some kind of general response, a uh, general response or comments uh, on what Sana said. Yeah, I have three points. One is the, the, the responsibility of companies. Um, from our point of view here, what we try to do with EU funding is mainly to support small and medium uh, sized enterprises. And uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, really the, the public services, the public uh, sphere, people directly, uh, smaller projects, um, and much less so the large companies. Why? We believe that if you have legislation, if you have environmental legislation, if you have local uh, social legislation, then large companies have to follow this legislation. It's not, as some argue, that you need to create financial incentives for large enterprises to simply follow legislation. That's certainly an advantage that we have in the EU and not, but not on the global level that um, such legislation uh, exists. And uh, it's mostly the, the smaller enterprises and the public sphere that needs additional funding to follow that. We believe the large enterprises already have the means and um, should do what is their legal obligation. For example, the polluter pays principle, we try to write it in each piece of legislation, but it, it's a general principle and generally applies in uh, all EU legislation. Secondly, uh, and it is a little bit linked to that, is what are the, um, what are the selection criteria? Well, as I said, the, the, the concrete selection of projects needs to be made on the on the regional or local level however what we try what the parliament uh, always tries to make sure is that uh, such funding of course follows uh, the criteria set out in the paris agreement um, that it that it um, that the projects ensure gender equality that uh, uh, gender equal pay that they contribute to job creation that they follow the do no harm principle um, that they also uh, follow the, the um, sustainable development goals. So this is something that is that is very dear to really a majority in the European Parliament. Um, even if not in all legislation, this is uh, written in from the outset. And last one, I think Darren made a, a very important point that hap that I have heard very often when I talk to people from. Uh, affected regions is that you cannot simply turn a coal or an industrial region uh, into something completely new and modern right away. I mean, right from 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 now to tomorrow, uh, it needs a transition period, and that's uh, why that's why we support what we said from the beginning. You need capacity building at a local level. You need to empower um, the, the communities and the municipalities and even the, the, the people who decide uh, on the political level uh, locally to, to find out how to create strategies, how to even how to ask for, for funding. Um, this is something that we are very well aware in, uh, in Europe um, and still it is it is still too, there's still too, too little funding as such, but still too little um, training opportunities also for those who um, are the beneficiaries of uh, future funding. Great, um, thank you, Nora. Um, we have um, approximately 10 minutes left, um, but uh, what I'll try and do is maybe select some of the questions. Uh, that have been asked. I mean, uh, quite a few of them already have already been answered. Um, but I, I, I was maybe thinking of uh, beginning for, with the question from an anonymous attendee uh, uh, on um, informal sectors that directly or indirectly uh, are affected by, for example, the closure of a coal mine. I guess 
Um, I was thinking of maybe asking Darren, I mean, in the case of Australia, it maybe has less to do with the informal sector, but maybe to provide some kind of insights into how you know, um, local communities and local economies that are also dependent on you know, the, uh, the, the, the power plant that is being closed, um, whether or not you know, there are any efforts or initiatives that are taken to support those local economies that are indirectly dependent. On, uh, on the power plant, if she has any, maybe any examples in mind uh, and, and how the, of, of how those, those communities and local economies could also be supported. Yeah, look, I mean, there's, there's plenty of examples. And I, know, I think, you know, the, the auto industry was mentioned. We've got a long history of auto industry restructuring in many parts of the world where many lessons have been learned, good and bad. Um, about how we support communities in transition. So in a sense, I don't think this is anything particularly new. Um, when a company closure closes in a, in a region that is dependent on that uh, industry, it's, it's devastating. I guess that we, for, for coal regions, the challenges are much greater in the, in the sense that often they're somewhat uh, remote, I suppose. The infrastructure, it, it was built up, particularly around that industry. Um, and, and people moved to that region solely for, for the opportunities there. And we're also talking about a pretty narrow skill set and a very specialized uh, skills associated with the nature of that work, which doesn't easily even translate to the renewable energy sector. In, in some cases. Um, I do think, I mean, there's always a lot of talk about the importance of, of, of small business and local initiatives. And I do think that stuff's incredibly important. And there's a lot of that going on. Uh, the Latrobe Valley Authority, who I mentioned there, and I've sent a link to others, you know, they're doing a lot of work in that space to get investment into the area. And, but it, it does tend to be uh, uh, small scale projects and so on. Um, and there is that remuneration challenge for these regions, right? These were really high paid jobs, the most lucrative jobs in the region. That's why people move there. And they're being replaced with part-time, low paid jobs in, in many ways. Um, so while empowerment is incredibly important and these regions are, I hate the word resilient, but they are resilient, um, nonetheless, uh, without jobs and opportunities, particularly for young people, we're just going to see people move to, in, in the case of Australia, to, to urban, urban cities like, like Melbourne. Um, but there are a number of initiatives uh, that are taking place. And to be, to be honest, there's a, there's, a, there's a major initiative uh, to build an offshore wind farm, which will generate significant uh, Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Darren. Um, there are just so many really interesting questions. So um, unfortunately, we won't be able to answer all of them, but we will. Uh, we will send them to the panelists, and we will uh, respond to them uh, at a later stage. But I, if I just had one question um, that I felt is particularly relevant to, to Jessica, I mean, it is a question by uh, Keston Perry on the Green Climate Fund, um, and so here is the question. Um, so there was a recent article in Environmental Politics that, that scrutinizes the, the Green Climate Fund as an important source of financialization, especially its country ownership emphasis, due to the role that private investors play in legitimizing a top-down financialization of recipient countries. Um, do you have any thoughts on the Green Climate Fund as an appropriate and effective mechanism that actually supports and delivers climate justice, especially given its emphasis on offering returns to investors that benefit from climate devastation and justice the developing countries face. So Jessica, uh, maybe in two minutes, <laughs> if that's at all um, possible. <laughs> that's a very good question, Kirsten. And I, I totally agree with the article. I've read it and I've read another article written by the same author, I think, unless you could find into different ones, that says that the GCF is usually it's kind of a performative, um, it, the UCF is largely performative to just show that we're investing in climate action or we're making progress in climate action based on very top-down identified indicators that do not actually contribute to vulnerability reduction. 
at the very, very um, elemental sense. And so um, I think the GCF does have potential, but it would need to undergo major restructuring, a very huge transformation for which to actually address the climate justice concerns that are being um, experienced um, within, um, within developing countries at the moment. But for now, based on the trajectory that it's taking, um, all action remains very performative. It's just working with developing countries to identify um, priorities that have been identified by governments or priorities that have been identified by international accredited entities, which have not really made much progress over the last um, decade or two. And so, um, and so, yeah, to achieve climate justice, I think there'll, be, there'll need to be a very huge transformation to focus on local communities would focus on priorities that are actually important for local communities as, as opposed to international and national government actions. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Jessica, for that. Um, and maybe a, a final question, given the time that, uh, that's left. Um, and I will ask this to a uh, question to Nora. Um, so it's a question uh, from um, David Patterson. Um, on the issue of um, human rights. And so the question is uh, the following. So to what extent are international, regional and national human rights frameworks useful in understanding and encouraging state obligations to ensure a just transition? Um, so Nora, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, of course, international, social and human rights uh, frameworks are always useful and we want uh, them to be strengthened wherever possible uh, on, on each level. Um, from my understanding, the idea of just transition is exactly uh, this, that of course, on the one hand, we need uh, the protection of environment, we need more sustainable production uh, and ways of living, but uh, why do we need it? We need it uh, in order to, to preserve our joint uh, common human right of, uh, for, of a decent living and of uh, peacefully living together. And, well, you can, you can extend it to the international level, but also uh, see it on the local level, the, the right to decent housing, the right to, to actually energy as well. Uh, um, and at the same time, uh, there, the question was also, there was a second question asking whether we, we do not only uh, relocate our emissions to the rest of the world. Well, yes. Uh, that could be that could be uh, um, a danger, but on the other hand, uh, here that's that's what I mean with policy coherence. Uh, we need, of course, uh, obligations to our enterprises as well to not do that, to to, to not simply relocate dirty energies, uh, but to uh, uh, for a co corporate social and environmental responsibility, which is not a voluntary uh, uh, issue, but which, which, is a, which is a legal obligation for our European enterprises. Uh, this is not directly my field of work, but I'm, I'm, uh, I, I know that many people, in particular, of course, from the left and green side in the European Parliament are indeed working also on uh, this uh, kind of legislation. And I'm very proud that my party is a part of this movement. Um, yeah, given the time, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to say also this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. Um, and so I guess this is, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as I say, I mean, there are just so many interesting questions. I think some of them have been answered by our panelists, but there are still some that need that remain to be answered. We will definitely um, record the questions and kind of respond to them and make sure that our panelists also have an opportunity to do so. Um, so um, just before I, I, I quick, I briefly wrap up. I mean, I, um, I just uh, um, ask you uh, pan, uh, uh, participants to just uh, remember to please, if you have a few minutes to spare, uh, um, fill in our feedback survey, as I say, which is extremely, extremely useful to us. Um, and uh, then I'd just like to thank the speakers again uh, for uh, their um, uh, wisdom, for their inputs. Um, I think it was, uh, they provided a lot of things to, to discuss and to think about. And I think, you know, the, the fact that we received so many questions uh, uh, is once again, just a uh, testament to the fact that, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of material to, dis to, to, to discuss and still to discuss in the future. So I hope we'll have an opportunity to continue to pursue this discussion uh, within the JT. Um, uh, I'd also obviously like to thank um, uh, um, Dunya and Akiko, uh, who are also uh, 
instrumental in organizing uh, these webinars uh, and for making my life so much easier with all the notes for the <laughs> for the for, for the chairperson notes which I've been reading and which are amazing um, and also finally uh, thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for for their support uh, for these for this webinar series and more generally for the JTRC's work uh, over the past two years. And so we really hope that um, the JTRC will be able to continue to have these conversations and to, 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 to on just transition, which again, in this kind of context, in the current context, the global context, and also in the, the context of the pandemic seems even more relevant and important. Uh, um, and uh, before we leave and before I say goodbye, um, I'd also like to just announce our next webinar, which will focus on community-based action on just transitions. Um, and so this webinar will, will take place on the 24th of November. So stay tuned, uh, you will receive information on this uh, webinar, uh, um, which is our penultimate webinar of this series. Um, so, um, and which we really also look forward to uh, organizing. So as I say, we'll be in, we'll be in touch uh, with more information on this in the, uh, in the coming days. Uh, um, so as I say, the 24th of November, 24th of November. So just write that down in your agendas and we hope to see you, uh, to see you then. Um, and so until then, um, goodbye, have a great day. <laughs>